Okay, welcome back, folks. So, as I mentioned, or you might have missed, I am doing a bit of a, what I would like to call the Black Princesses, Black Queens, Mythological or Real. This time around, it's Sarah Bonetta. I've mentioned Sarah Bonetta before. Her story has captured me. It did a while back. And I did mention it during my Queen Charlotte video or my... um and Boleyn video <laughs> but it was, it's one of the two but I never went into depth in depth about this um, wonderful woman from history so Sarah Bonetta sometimes described as the goddaughter of Queen Victoria was in fact the Yoruban princess evidenced by her tribal facial markings who was taken and given to Queen Victoria by Frederick E. Forbes the captain of the HMS Bonetta, hence her name. Sarah is believed to have been born in 1843 and was captured by King Gizo or Gezo of um, the Dahomey tribe in some five years later in 1848 roughly or 1849. She was kept for two years in captivity in the Dahomey kingdom by King Gizo, who allegedly wanted to sacrifice her. He was a notorious Dahomey king, obnoxious, uh, <laughs> uh, among other things. He, he apparently still practiced human sacrifice, but he kept her alive because she was a princess and only wanted to sacrifice her for a special occasion. She was ultimately rescued by Frederick E. Forbes, who was the captain of the HMS Bonetta in roughly, I think it was 1850, around there. She was taken by him, and by all accounts, he became fond of her and decided that he would give her to Queen Victoria as a gift, as she was a princess. Forbes brought her to England in 1850. So Sarah Bonetta, or Sarah Forbes Bonetta, later she would go by other names. By all accounts, Queen Victoria became fond of her immediately and accepted her as a gift. However, Queen Victoria, she was not actually raised by Queen Victoria, though Queen Victoria did agree to cover all of her living expenses. She was actually initially raised by the Forbes family, so Forbes and his wife. So in this um, letter that was captured in the Royal Archives, it says the Queen has at present under her protection a little African girl about eight years old who was brought to the country by Commander Forbes from the King of Dahomey. <laughs> the Queen... Having made inquiry, the Queen has informed that the climate of the country is often fatally hurtful to the health of African children, and the Queen is therefore anxious that this child should be educated in one of Her Majesty's dependencies upon the coast of Africa. So what this is about is it was the belief that people from different uh, climatic regions could not acclimatize themselves to a different region. So she came from a tropical part of the world, and she wasn't doing very well in England, so they assume it was due to the weather. So she was only in England for about a year before they sent her to Africa to be educated in a missionary school. So by all accounts, Sarah was very popular in these missionary schools, and she was favored student. It says Miss Sass became her unofficial guardian, taking her on picnics and to nearby markets. The teachers at the school treated Sarah as special, allowing her to dress in the clothing that she brought from England or what was made for her from material sent by the queen who often sent her gifts, while the other children wore simple dresses. At the age of eight, Sarah could talk about her visits to Windsor Castle. She got favored education and she was even allowed to host a royalty party in honor of the queen's birthday. So in Sarah did really well in the school and her health improved and by 1855 she was brought back to England by May 1st. There was a letter from the Honorable Mrs. Phipps who was her 
guardians asking to send for Sally. Sally is a nickname for Sarah. So Sally Forbes Benedict wants to England by Her Majesty's command. It was not clear why they requested her back in England, <laughs> but having consulted our missionary brethren who agreed with me that the command was too pre preemptory to admit of delay, I immediately made preparations. And on the 23rd of June, Sally sailed for England under the care of Reverend E. Dicker. So by this point, Sarah, Sarah, known as Sally, was also was a teenager and she was getting a lot of attention and the Queen here admired her figure. <laughs> Apparently Queen Victoria, who was very short and plus size, she was under five feet tall and heavy set, was very obsessed with her weight. So it makes sense if she would notice that she said, saw Sally Forbes, the Negro girl who, whom I've educated. She's immensely grown and has a lovely figure. This was in December 1855 after Sarah had returned to England. By all accounts, Sarah Bonetta's presence in England was welcome when she first arrived, although it might have been a case of a spectacle where, you know, there, they, there weren't many black people in England, although it, it, um, based on what I've read, Sarah, because she was treated exceptionally, she was treated as royalty, as opposed to the other black people there who would have been merchants or laborers. Sarah was sort of, people were fond of her. She was always described as well-dressed. She carried herself well, or she was dressed really well, and people welcomed her in their settings. So according to one account, um, Sarah's relationships with the royal children always seem to be quite positive. She refers to the Prince of Wales as Bertie, and the Prince of Wales, of course, is the crown prince, the one who will become king. And one of her letters mentions her correspondence with prin Princess Alice, but the most public show of her connection with the royal family occurred at the wedding of, prin of the Princess Royale, who's the eldest daughter of Queen Victoria. A command has been received from Her Majesty for Sarah Bonetta Forms, the young African princess, to be present to witness the marriage ceremony of the Princess Royale. Her Majesty has manifested her thoughtful care towards the princess by forwarding her within the last few days a supply of dresses and other uh, requisites suitable to be worn for the occasion. Furthermore, it says she was always well dressed and accompanied wherever she went by someone of the wealthy Forbes family, her uh, who took care of her, someone or someone from the palace. The story of her coming to England had been published in Britannia and other newspapers. She was not like the blacks that had come from America or the entertainers or the colorful black characters who scraped by out, scraped out their living either begging or sweeping the streets. Sarah was a celebrity, a young girl of substance. So when Sarah was 17, she became unofficially engaged to a man named James Davies, who was born in West Africa and who, like her, attended missionary schools and who was taken under the care of a, a Reverend Venn, which with whom he worked. James Davies was much older than Sarah. So he was by this point in his 30s and he was a widower. His wife his wife had died. Sarah, by all account, didn't love him and did not want to marry him. However, she was sort of pushed into marrying him to the point where her loved one even isolated her by sending her to Brighton in Wales to live with a family there. She frequently complained about how dreadful it was living there and how she wanted to be around all the people she loved. So Sarah married James Davies in August of 1962, which was a few months after the actual wedding of Princess Alice, which was in, I think, July of 1962. And this was due to the death of Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband. By all accounts, Sarah did grow to love James, although she complained that he was a pushover, more or less. She did say that the fact is James is infinitely too good and kind to everybody, and he is not appreciated, and when he does anything, people distract him as a matter of course, and I think it is and I think it his duty to labor for the benefit of others, but because they're all jealous of his position and influence, they're only too ready to cry him down and abuse him. And thank you, 
but but thank you that will not hurt him for he knows in whom he has trusted and is safe sarah's wedding was attended by a mixture of prominent black and white uh individuals and um not long after she and james who mainly made a living by traveling return to Africa. Yeah, so Sarah actually returned to the Church Missionary Society, which is the missionary school she had attended in Africa for a few years before she had to return to England. But Sarah ultimately was being groomed to take over the school as she was um, well educated by English teachers and English subjects and by all counts was a gifted and bright student when she was there. She was also the wife of a successful businessman and apparently there were many issues with the school because the english women who taught the school known as the female institution in freetown were can they, they considered themselves culturally superior to the africans whom they looked down upon and sarah with her superior education and you know her um acquaintances with the queen was often superior to them which is something they had a problem with because, you know, she's black and yet she had a superior um, upbringing to all of them. But before that, Sarah's relationship with James grew into one of love and admiration. They did have a daughter, um, ultimately three children, but their firstborn daughter, Victoria, was named after Queen Victoria. Supposedly, this account appeared in the anti-slavery reporter the queen presented to her godchild this is sarah's daughter a beautiful gold cup with a salver knife fork and spoon of the same precious metal as a baptismal present the cup and salver bear the following inscription to victoria davies from her godmother victoria queen of great britain and ireland 1863 huh she named her daughter after the queen <laughs> sarah's life um was short-lived as i said she was meant to take over the school and did relatively well but started to suffer from the breathing problems and the coughs and fevers that had plagued her throughout much of her life no one knew what it was at the time at some time in between 1879 and 1880 she was brought to madeira in portugal at the royal edinburgh hotel where she stayed and there she wrote a one of her final letters regarding um her feelings we never got much about her feelings on many things she for example did not write about the issues of enslavement or colonialism and mainly like women of that day wrote about relatively frivolous stuff she died sarah of consumption in Madeira, Portugal, where she was buried. Consumption, of course, was the old name for tuberculosis. She left behind three young children. Her eldest daughter, Victoria, there is a photo of her and she does have descendants. She had two other children. However, um, her eldest daughter, Victoria, remained in touch with Queen Victoria until Queen Victoria's death in 1901. She herself went on to marry. Sarah has many descendants. But as I said, we never really got to know Sarah Bonetta all that much, what she thought about much of anything. We do know she was a bright student and was loved by most people around her. But um, even her name, she often signed letters as either Edda or Inna. And no one knows why. She was named Sarah by Frederick E. Forbes, who rescued her from the Dahomey King, but he also suggested in his book, Dahomey and the Dahomeans, that he didn't know what her actual name was, and there might have been a selective memory loss due to trauma where she could not remember her true name. Some people believe it might have been a variation of either Etta or Inna, which are names that she would use to sign letters, but this has never been confirmed. But this was just a little bio on Sarah Bonetta. She lived a very brief life. She died before the age of 40 of tuberculosis in Madeira, Spain. Long lives Princess Sarah.